Welcome to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we are broadcasting live on October 29th from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. I want to thank Jason Marlowe for filling in for me last week. Today on Tuesday Cafe, we're going to talk about water and about the election. Later on in the show, we'll hear from both sides on Amendment 3. That's the Florida ballot initiative that would give adults in Florida the right to recreationally use cannabis. We'll also get updates on the election from the Pasco County Supervisor of Elections. So I hope you stay tuned for all of that. And you can participate during the show. You can email us, dj at wmnf.org. You can text 813-4330-885, or you can call 813-239-9663. And you can get in the queue right now if you'd like to ask us questions. Our first topic is water, and our guests are with the Political Action Committee, Florida's Right to Clean Water. Captain Carl Degert is the group's chair, and Joe Bonassia is the group's Southwest Florida chair. Welcome back to Tuesday Cafe, Carl and Joe. Thank you, Joe. And thank you for your continued interest in our effort. I thanks for thank you for coming in, and we'll talk in a little bit about your petition drive. But let's back up to the beginning, and let me just ask: What does that mean? A right to clean water? Joe, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, our effort would establish a fundamental right, an enforceable right, to clean and healthy waters. We've enshrined it in the state constitution. This would enable us to hold our state executive branch accountable when, through its action or inaction, it allows harm to our waters. And our waters are not in good condition, not at all. Um, a, a few quick examples. We've got 1,000 springs, 800 of them are uh, impaired. We've got nearly a million acres of estuaries and 9,000 miles of rivers and streams contaminated with fecal bacteria. Red tide over the last 30 years has, has exploded. So we've got many issues. We've been working on them for a long time with little success. Other states have constitutional environmental rights They've been very beneficial. We want to have the rights that they have. We had you on the show a couple of years ago and you were trying to get this question on the 2024 ballot, but you decided last year that 2026 would be a better target. And that involves gathering signatures. So why don't you tell us how many signatures would you need to get this on the ballot in 2026 and how you're going about gathering those signatures? So we have a assembly of ambassadors statewide. Um, we currently have over 400. We need many more. We need uh, to make this happen. Um, we need 900,000 signatures and the legislature only allows you two years to do that. So <clears throat> realistically, you're looking at thousands of uh, petition signatures a month. Um, we are totally volunteer grassroots. So we don't have the deep pockets that other initiatives like marijuana and um, the right to choose have. Um, they spend about $5 million per 100,000 signatures. In the election cycle 2022 to 2024, our, la our last attempt, uh, we um, are very proud of our gathering 110,000 signatures fully volunteer. When you compare that with uh, just a few thousand dollars spent compared to millions of dollars spent, we're proud of that work. But um, we need every Floridian on board to make this happen. And right now, when people are going to early voting, they're they're voting in person, a lot of people in Florida, and you have a push to the polls initiative. What's that? Well, that sure. Okay. We, we want to get as many of our volunteers at polling places at po as possible, because only registered uh, Florida voters can sign our petitions. And at the polls, that's all you that's all you meet, registered voters. They're engaged people. They want to be part of their government. They're voting. I would add that this move is based on um, history. Back in 1994, Florida had the Gilmet ban. That was placed on the ballot because volunteers were able to get hundreds of thousands of petitions in one day, election day, 1992. 
to the best of my knowledge, that's the last time a purely grassroots initiative has been successful. We want to come as close as we can to doing what they did. And so I, I gather that people will be, when they go to the polls, you know, they're thinking about the current election. If someone comes up to them with a clipboard trying to get their signature, how will they know that it's your, uh, this is your amendment, your petition drive, rather than some other random thing that they, that they might be uh, asked to sign? Well, m many of our volunteers have T-shirts that have a big uh, Right to Clean Water logo on the front. Others have good-sized buttons that identify them as volunteers for the Right to Clean Water. So there'll be you no know, mistaking that they're there to support a candidate or any of the other initiatives. Right to Clean Water, uh, we're very nonpartisan. Everybody wants clean water, and it immediately disarms folks. Our guests are with the Political Action Committee, Florida's Right to Clean Water. We have Captain Carl Diger, the group's chair, and Joe Bonassia, the group's Southwest Florida chair. And this is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're broadcasting live on October 29th from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. Uh, so earlier you talked about other states that had done similar types of movements. There's this rights of nature movement. So what can you tell us about that and what's happening in other states as well? Okay, uh, Carl, ahead, do you want me to take it or are you going to take it? Yeah, go ahead, Joe. All right, so uh, it, uh, Pennsylvania and Montana have had environmental constitutional rights since the 1970s. New York is the last state to uh, enshrine it in their constitution. That was a couple of years ago. I'll bring to everyone's attention a very important case. Two summers ago in Montana, it was a youth climate case. In that uh, situation, Montana had a law on its books that prevented its Department of Environmental Quality from considering environmental consequences when issuing permits to fossil fuel companies. 16 young Montanans considered this to be a violation of their rights because it was just going to aggravate the climate crisis. There have been lots of youth climate cases. So far, this has been the only one that has been successful. And it's because that case was predicated on their right to a clean and healthy environment in their constitution. Pennsylvania has had equally important uh, legal victories. I wanted to make a distinction, though, that what we're pushing right now, what we're promoting, is strictly a human right to clean and healthy waters. It is not giving uh, any aspects of nature any rights. Uh, there is a a healthy rights of nature movement um, internationally. And we do have Florida Rights of Nature Network. That's how we began. And perhaps you'll recall in 2020, Orange County did something historic and they passed their Rights of Nature, Right to Clean Water Charter Amendment. It was because the state legislature very quickly stepped in and preempted the authority of local governments to pass rights of nature laws or to pass laws giving citizens any rights to any aspect of the natural world that compelled us to say, okay, legislature is not going to work, let, allow us to work on environmental protection at the local level. Then we've got to go over their heads and amend the state constitution. And that's why we're doing what we're doing today. Let's walk through some, 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 uh, possibilities. Let's say that you gather enough signatures to get on the 2026 ballot, and let's say that 60% of Floridians pass the amendment and it becomes part of the Florida Constitution. What would that look like? Let's say, um, you know, there's some sort of water issue in your community after this becomes part of the Constitution. What would you then be able to do that you couldn't do now? So the state executive agencies, the reason our language focused exclusively on state executive agencies is when we look at pollution across the state and why it occurs and how it's allowed to occur, it all begins with legislative and regulatory decision-making. So that's why we focused on that. So through permitting um, and the issuance of permits, it essentially um, allows pollution to occur with impunity. Um, we, the state executive agencies issue permits for water bottling to extract trillions of gallons of year 
uh, water per year. Um, they issue water uh, consumption permits to industrial use, um, for example, phosphate mining. And um, development, destruction of wetlands, it's all done by permit. So permitting basically just makes an illegal activity, a legal activity, with um, the polluter um, experiencing no liabilities for any damages they occur that occur. So we now have the legal standing with this new law to um, fight those um, permit issuances without um, being personally harmed or damaged, which usually make, requires uh, is a requirement to litigate. Earlier, we talked about what was happening with some, several different types of water in in uh, the state. Let's go one by one. L what about our springs? How are those eight hundred, or if is that is that the number? How are those eight hundred springs being imperiled? What are um, what are the impacts? How is it happening, and what can be done about it? So excessive extraction, either through water bottling or development. Um, allows greater intrusion um, of surface waters into the springs carrying all the nutrients. And it also allows saltwater intrusion from below through the car st structure that we have here in Florida. So as you suck more water out, um, those pollutants are able to go in there. Um, you can visit our springs um, to the uninformed. These are pristine, beautiful places, but when you look closely, you'll see bright green algae blooms covering the natural grasses um, and smothering the natural habitat. Um, it's devastating to watch. And it's not just springs, but you mentioned earlier also estuaries and rivers. How are they being impacted in, in by policy in Florida and development in Florida? So primarily, um, you know, we have failed infrastructure is a huge impact on the environment. Um, you know, on the backside of the two hurricanes recently, you know, we have millions, millions of gallons from multiple municipalities spewing into our uh, lakes and rivers. Um, we now have a raging red tide bloom off the west coast of Florida. Um, so that's, a, and then we have most, uh, phosphate mining discharges um, because of the storms as well. And, you know, a lot of that stuff is phosphorus based, phosphate based, and it just feeds these, you know, the red tides and, and the other algae blooms uh, once it's pumped into the uh, open waters. Yeah, we know about the Hurricane Milton and phosphate spills. The Mosaic Company said that polluted water flowed into Tampa Bay from their Riverview plant after Hurricane Milton, and that rainfall from, from Milton overwhelmed the phosphate mining facility there. Mosaic representatives said more than 17,500 gallons of polluted water may have spilled into Tampa Bay. Uh, that's a report that our WMF's Chris Young did about a week or so ago about the phosphate spill after Hurricane Milton. Um, for people who might not be that familiar with phosphate and how important it is in the uh, as a limiting nutrient in in natural ecosystems in Florida, why would it be bad to spill excess phosphorus into um, Tampa Bay? So the nitrogen phosphorus balance um, is what fuels these uh, algae blooms, whether they are in Lake Okeechobee or whether they're in Tampa Bay. Um, once the phosphorus and, uh, level reaches a certain um, point, it, it just fuels these blooms. And there's, there's no technology uh, that exists that can be scaled to scrub the waters clean. Now, on a small scale, yeah, you can filter a few thousand um, gallons a day. But when you look at the, the capacity of, for example, Lake Okeechobee, it holds a trillion gallons. If you process tens, even a, you know, a million gallons a day, it would take decades to clean Lake Okeechobee. So we have to address pollution at the source. And just looping back on um, the amendment, it sets a ground of reference for all legislative and regulatory decision-making where once something is proposed and taken to the floor for, for discussion, they first have to hold it in the light of the right to clean water of Floridians. And if it's determined that that action or proposal is going to harm our waters, they're going to have to go back and fix it so that it does not. And 
there are instances where in the public interest, certain activities could be allowed under the, the amendment, such as, and I think it would be easy to argue that phosphate mining is in the public interest to create um, fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides and all the other phosphate-based um, chemicals that are just you know harming our environment. But if allowed, then the amendment would require the um, applicant, permit applicant, to take all necessary steps to prevent that harm to occur. So it really bolsters um, the environmental protection across Florida. I want to remind people that we're speaking with Florida's right to clean water advocates, Captain Carl Deger and Joe Bonassia, the group's Southwest Florida chair. And Captain Carl is the chair of, of the, the group. And we're talking on Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF Tampa. And uh, just as if, if you're listening here on October 29th, listening live, we have people who are writing in. And so let me read this question that comes in from the area code 941. He is suggesting, or she, sorry, I don't know who is writing in. What if you were to support clean, active springs? If water starts at the springs, why not push pristine springs and then won't clean water follow from there? So what about this listeners question about supporting clean active springs so well, our, go ahead Jeff. well our amendment would do that our amendment is broader than just springs because we have problems that far exceed just just springs and so if you're going to go through uh, the entire process of amending the state constitution and it's a herculean task you want to be able to be as effective as possible and to get as much bang for your buck. Yes, we want clean, pure, pristine springs, but you know, no state has more acres of polluted lake water than does Florida. I want to be working on that issue at the same time we're working on the springs issue. Our so, amendment is broad enough to cover both. Go ahead, Carl. Yeah, so when we look at the springs, um, I believe the comment was the, the the water starts there. Well, actually, the water doesn't start in the spring itself. It starts in our wetlands. We've lost over one third of our wetlands. The wetlands are the kidneys of Florida that filter the waters to into the ground to reach the aquifer to then boil out. Um, you know, over thousands of miles, it slowly seeps down there and then comes back out. Um, our aquifers and that feed these springs start up into Georgia, North Carolina, and, you know, the impacts, you know, well outside our boundaries are impacting the water that boils out of the ground in Florida. So we have to look at that issue. Well, I want to thank you both for coming on WMNF's Tuesday Cafe, Carl and Joe. Thank, thank you very much, Sean. We and really appreciate I... the continued support. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, Car Captain Carl Diekert is the chair of Florida's Right to Clean Water, and Joe Bonassia is the group's Southwest Florida chair. They're gathering petitions to get a right to clean water on the 2026 Florida ballot, and you can find out more at floridarighttocleanwater.org. Thanks so much for joining us.